Welcome to Growth Marketer Academy with Ryan and Andrea Eldridge. When it comes to email marketing, your subject line will make or break your campaign. No matter how great your offer, if you can't get your lead to open your email, your efforts are wasted. And I hate wasted time. Or worse, you could get tagged as spam. <gasps> no. Fear not. We have some tricks up our sleeve. Up our sleeve. Yeah. To ensure your emails get opened. And you stay out of the trash bin. I don't want to be in the trash bin. Nope. This is Ryan Eldridge. And this is Andrea Eldridge. Welcome to Growth Marketer Academy. This is episode 15 of the Growth Marketer Academy podcast. I'm Ryan Eldridge, Chief Strategist of Squirrel Digital Marketing. And this is Andrea Eldridge, Creative Director at Squirrel Digital Marketing. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about A-B testing and how to maximize the effectiveness of your landing pages. We love optimizing for conversions and optimizing those conversions. And when it comes to an email campaign, you can't convert a lead that never opens your message, which is why your subject line is one of the most important components of any email campaign. But isn't, I mean, who uses email anymore? A bunch of old people, right? I mean, it's a dead medium. I know, you know, a lot of people think that, but it really actually, it isn't. By the end of 2017, there was an estimated 3.7 billion, which I always sound like I should say that like Austin Powers, billion email users. And to put that in perspective, Facebook has 1.9 billion users. So like 90% of adults in the U.S. use email. It's the most popular online activity across all age groups. So Hold it's on. not just old people. It's Hold on, like I gotta check, gotta teenagers. Check my email. Yeah, you got to, and maybe some yeah. Facebook. Okay. Um, it's... Everybody across all age groups, it's the most popular online activity for those people who use the internet. The better thing, really, when it comes to email is ROI, return on investment. That's yeah. my favorite from the money perspective. Yes. Um, for every dollar spent on a successful email campaign, you can expect $38 in return. So if it, if you do it right, email oh. can be hu hugely profitable. But you have if to you do, do it right. right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because otherwise I'm like, disclaimer right there. I got a few bucks. I can drop that on some email mm -hmm. campaigns, make 38 bucks each. Nice. Except you got to do it right. right. So starting with what we're talking about today, which is your subject line, uh, that's like your first piece of the puzzle. You know, if you don't have a subject line that gets that person to actually see your message, be intrigued enough to open your message and actually take the effort to click, then you're dead in the water. It doesn't matter how great your offer is. It doesn't matter how great your product is. None of that's going to matter if you can't get them to at least just click it. But how do you, I mean, like, okay, so I, I, I write this amazing email. It's got beautiful gifts and pictures in it, and it's like little flowers and wonderfulness. That sounds like a perfect and email. I, and I send it out to somebody. How, what's my open rate going to look like? I mean, what, 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 is, what, measure, what measurement am I using to measure my success? Good question. I know, because yes. I read ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so open rate is really the key to this equation. That's how many people actually open your email. And the average open rate for an email campaign is 25%. So for every 100 messages you send, you can expect that 25 of them will get opened again if you aren't doing a super terrible campaign. Um, but we think you can outperform that average and you should certainly aim to outperform that average. So you should just use that kind of as your baseline benchmark. If you're getting lower open rates than 25%, then you know you've got some things that need to be addressed. If you're over that, then I wouldn't say work complete because we feel like oh, there's always room to improve. That's but, when A-B testing comes in. Yes, but I would say that, you know, that at least you know that you're not, you know, super, super messing anything up. Okay, so when it comes to doing your email headlines... Yes. We should start with step number one. Yes. Subject headline tip number one, you like to call KISS. Yes. K-I-S-S. -S. Back, we back when we were kids, it was called keep it simple, stupid. But yeah. now I hear that stupid isn't something we're supposed to say anymore. Not according to my sixth year old. So yeah. now, it's, now it's keep it simple, silly. Silly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm as, still I'm still down as, with stupid, but that's cool. Catching. Yeah. So basically, this comes down to that clear and concise subject lines perform really well. Um, you got to remember, the average person gets a junk ton of emails in a given day. I have a feeling you know the exact number. I do. Really? It's 121 emails that's a day a for a the average person. Yeah. A lot of those get sent straight to spam or junk or um, auto archived. But if you happen to manage to get in front of the eyes of that person, you just have to remember how 
inundated and fatigued they probably are. So you, you, if you remember, most people who are going to read a blog post or, or any kind of content you put online, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to scan it to mm -hmm. see how much of a time investment they're going to have to put into this. They do the same thing with their emails. And so if they're getting an email from a company that they have a, a mild interest in, if your subject line is, you know, 47 words long with a subheading line and then, oh, you know, it, that's going to be insane. So what yeah. you want to do is make them short and sweet, nice and easy to read, something they can consume within a uh, just a glance in a line at Starbucks. Yeah. In fact, Mailer Mail recommends that uh, you limit your subject lines to 28 to 39 characters. They did some studies based on open rates and um, the effectiveness of subject lines, and that was kind of the sweet spot. So if you missed that the first time around, that's 28 to 39 characters. I know it can sound tedious to count those out, but it uh, do yourself a favor and actually check some of the length of your subject lines. There's a couple reasons why it's important. Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, how many people consume email only on one device, right? I, I look at my email on my phone. I look at it on my computer. I look at it on uh, my tablet. So I'll see my emails in several different places. And the way that that email is presented to me is going to be different in each one of those devices. Right. And so if I'm on, if I'm on a little tiny screen on an on a iPhone, you know, mm -hmm. in the line at Starbucks, that's going to get really short and truncated. Whereas if I'm on my desktop, I can see a nice big long subject line. So yeah. you got to keep that in mind. Yeah, and so uh, like you're basically saying there, short subject lines are definitely a better experience for those looking at email on an iPhone or a mobile device of any sort. And that's a huge swath of the email yeah. using population these days gets their email on their phone. Um, long subject lines can get truncated, so it can drop off important words. So if you spend, you know, three taxing hours for contra you know, contriving this perfect subject line and that it's too long. And so what the person actually sees is just the first six words of your, it's so important that you read my, and that's it they see. You yeah. know, it's like at that point, you've your efforts are wasted. So we are gonna add uh, an image into the show notes. And so you'll kind of see what we're talking about. There'll be several emails there and you'll see a couple in there that we've highlighted that show where they've been cut off in mobile, yeah. whereas you'll see some other subject lines that are much smaller and shorter and easy to read. Yeah, so you can kind of see a good email on mobile experience versus a not so great experience on mobile. Number two, tip number two, arouse emotions to motivate action. So basically the key here is that people make decisions based more on emotion than logic. I yeah. mean, as I'm a pretty logical person, I like to think that I don't fall into that category, but I do, we all yeah. do. So one real, okay. <laughs> that was on purpose. Go ahead. We'll hold hands. No, okay, thank go you. Ahead. No. Okay. All right. So one powerful emotion that tends to drive people's actions is fear of missing out. This would be something where, you know, you given essence of time or limited availability in a subject line, it's going to kind of engage that emotional response of saying, oh, well, I don't really want to like not have my opportunity if this really is a good deal. So you'd use that subject line to trigger a feeling of urgency or loss aversion. So you can do this by hinting at time sensitivity. Yeah. Um, you can mention an upcoming deadline. You can refer to limited time remaining to take advantage of an offer or a limited number of remaining slots available. Uh, your intent here is to get readers to act fast and to click through your email. You're gonna use phrases like today only or get this deal before it's gone. Um, and you know, I know that we see these all the time and you think, okay, really, does it really work? These types of subject lines, those that create urgency, actually get a 22% higher click-through rate according to Email Institute. Email Institute, that is my go-to place for information about click-through You rates. always ask me for sources, so yeah. I tried to add them in this we'll, time. We'll put sources in the show notes so you can kind of see that we don't make these up. Uh, although it sounds like we do, because Email Institute, I know. it sounds like it sounds I created like I that place. two minutes ago and yeah. put it up there and justified my knowledge of click-through rates. But my tip here would be don't overdo it. You know, I think we all can feel like uh, the, the boy who cried wolf a little bit when you get a little too much. Like if every message that you send to your lead is like for today only or act now at a certain point, they're going to get fr just fatigued yeah. from this messaging. This is the 17th time you've told me that I'm going to miss out and I'm just OK. I'm fine. I'm yep. missing out. That's uh, OK. I'm uh, in fact, I'm going to miss you so much when I put you in spam. So the alternative here would be you can create that same sense of emotional response by 
opening what we would term a curiosity loop. So I'll let you kind of explain what that is. So a curiosity loop is, is when you when you say something like, I mean, you, you see this in television all the time, like the cliffhanger episodes, right? Yeah. So you, you're watching a show and all of a sudden you're like, oh, look at that flash. He's running so fast and he's going to save the day and the girl's going to, oh. All of a sudden it ends, right? Right before Flash does something or somebody shot him or something like that. And you're like, oh, is somebody going to survive? You have that urgency to find out what happened next. So you watch uh, next time on such and such. You see what's going, what's going to happen. Hints, right? But it doesn't give you the full, yeah. the full story. And so you, you tune in next week because your mind absolutely has to know what happened, especially if you're interested in the subject. Like, like if you're watching Flash, you might be interested in that or Game of Thrones or something. I was going like to say, we might have to change the subject or the uh, yeah. TV show if you're going to give me a sense of urgency. But yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. So it's the same thing. You, you, what you want to do is create a sense of urgency and open that loop that that they absolutely must know the answer to further down in your email. So your subject should increase, create some sort of intrigue, generate interest without giving away everything. So you could say something like, uh, "Have you ever had this problem? Tell me about it." Or you could, your brain ultimately wants resolution and closure to whatever the subject you're opening. Right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I've seen this a lot um, pretty effectively when it's things like, you know, the top three industry analysts know this secret, do you? You know, that yeah. sort of thing. Like, it seems like it w it almost what we would term clickbait these days, but yet... Um, a little more subtle than well, that. Buzz, or just BuzzFeed kind of does a really good job. They'll say they'll say like, here's the the three things you should know before Mother's Day, and number two will surprise you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you're like, what? The, what is that? What is I number wanna, two? Yeah. I thought I knew all. Eighty seven percent. Eighty seven percent of doctors know that you will die of this disease. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, or you know, nightly news does the exact same thing. There's something deadly in your refrigerator. Tune in at eleven. Yeah. Right. And you're like, what the hell? Wait. What's, no, what's wrong with my refrigerator? Know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and ultimately what this comes down to is your brain wants resolution and closure. And so your subject line, if it can open an, a loop to initiate that interest, the recipient is going to want to close that loop um, by clicking and seeing the body of your message and figure yeah. out the answer to this like stirring question that you just implanted in their brain. And when we go beyond subject lines, this is something you also do in your normal body of your email too. You might say, hey, I'm going to tell you about this great, amazing blah, 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 but I'll get to it in a minute. First, I'm going to talk about this. And then your brain's like, oh, okay, I need some resolution at some point. So I'll read the next paragraph to find out what you're saying. And then I expect you to resolve this. And then usually you open up a curiosity loop for your next email message. So you say something like, and next week I'll tell you more about, you know, whether or not, you know, Fifi lived through that harrowing experience. You're like, who the hell was Fifi? Funny story, actually. Yeah. As you're saying this, I'm remembering that uh, this is hugely popular with Stephen King. I mm. noticed this in his uh, writing recently that, like, we recently read a few of his novels for a book club that I'm in, and it was so funny because he'd end a chapter with, like, little did Fred know that it was the last time he'd see Harry alive. And you were like, wait, what? Um, yeah. how, wh so something happens, and then it would instantly compel you because you knew that next chapter was going to explain this random statement he just made out of nowhere where you were like, but no, what? Uh, what? And then it's 4 a.m., and yes. you're, you're 400 pages in, and you're like, son of a gun. Yes. I just need to yeah. go. Okay. But really, sense. if you do this effectively in email, it can cause kind of a, a milder version of that same drive. You're just looking to drive the compulsion to click and open that message. Yeah. Because that's, that's really ultimately the job of the subject line is to get them to take the next action. You're not trying to sell them the offer. You're not trying to sell them your branding. You're not trying to get them to do anything other than click through so that way they can see your message. Right. Tip number three, be personal and friendly. Like you. Yes, yeah. I do try. You are personal and friendly. So keep in mind that when it comes to emails, the ones that we look forward to receiving are not the shopping offer from Kohl's or the your interest rate has dropped on your mortgage. That's Those are like, all right. We look forward to getting email from friends and family. And those messages are people we know. They will often refer to us by our first name. They're engaged with us on a personal level. And so again, going back to the emotionality of, of driving this click, when you can personalize your message in a way that makes it feel unique to that recipient, it's going to engage that kind of like, oh, okay, this is something I want to see, not something that's being sent to everybody. 
So one way of doing personalization that is pretty popular these days is adding the recipient's name into either the subject of the message or, you know, somewhere in there. And yeah. we're talking about subject lines at this point. So, and um, subject lines that personally address a recipient do get a 30% higher click-through rate than those that do not. And this is according to Experian Marketing Services. So, um, and, and something to keep in mind, you're not going to write you know, let's say let's say you've got an email list of a, a, a small email list of a thousand people. Let's just say it's a really tiny list. You're not going to literally type in everybody's name into that email list. So if you're not used to doing email marketing, you're going to use an email marketing service uh, or like Mailchimp. You can yeah. use Constant Contact, things like that. Or you can get into the big boys. You can get HubSpot, or or you can try some of the freer versions like Ma- MailerLite, things like that. We can give you a whole list if you're interested. But ultimately, you're using these automation services where it will take the name. Uh, from your list and add it to it uh, using just an operator rather than having to type everybody's name in. So if you're like, oh my God, I'm not going to type in everybody's name. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing to keep in mind if you do that method though, is that you have to ensure that in your list, you have a first name or whatever name category, like column you're pulling from. You have to make sure that every entry has um, some value in that cell for that bit of data, because otherwise it's going to be one of those really weird messages to the recipient where it says, hey, you know, number sign colon. Have you seen our offer? Yeah. And they're gonna be like, "Wait, oh, what?" This I like is it when it says scam. "Hey," and then it's in brackets. It's his first name. Yeah, right. Comma. That's my favorite too. Hey, right. first name. <laughs> yes. So personal. That's, so that's like, yeah, that's like the 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 mail you get for, at your house that says current, "to current resident." Yeah. Very important. Right. And you're like, yeah. yeah, it's so important. Yeah. It goes to everybody. So yeah. So keep that in mind if you're using email automation, which you should be. But if you are going to utilize. Um, Uh, coded personalization. So the other thing I would say as a warning here is that so many marketers are using this name method at this point to personalize their email that people are really starting to associate this with spam. At least I do, um, in my opinion. Like I know that this, you know, random person who I've never heard this email message before doesn't really know me. And so if anything, it makes me kind of even more suspicious to like, why are they referring to me as, hey, Andrea? Because frankly, my friends never do say, hey, Andrea, in the subject line. It's true. (laughs) So consider instead giving other personalization cues. Um, One suggestion here would be um, tying your personalization to the recipient's location. Mm -hmm. So you could say something like best coffee house in Carmichael or the secret to saving on home insurance in Spokane. Um, This would be something that, again, tells that recipient that it's relevant to them without seeming super spammy. Yeah. And we we did a test once to, to find out what was our better... Uh, um, people clicking through our offer when we put the name in the message as well as in the subject line. And we found that in the uh, subject line, putting the name in there works pretty well. And then if you do down below where you'd put, where you'd normally be like, hey, Andrea, comma, and then you'd say your thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we tried hey, we tried hi there, we tried hi, and we tried the name. And the word hi, H-I, that's it, worked the best. So, because you're right, most people are going to go like, dear Andrea, like how many people write that? I know I do, but how many people really write that in an email when they're writing an email and says, dear so-and-so? For me, I actually Old usually start style. with hey there. Yeah. You're hey there. So I need this information. Can yeah. you help me out? So yeah. yeah, I think it varies from person to person. Tip number four, Ooh. add some visual jazz. Like music? <laughs> How do you make music visual? That's weird. So these days, some marketers have started adding emoji to their subject lines, which I'm not sure if I'm totally down with it, but the statistics seem to indicate that it can at least cause that subject to be visually catching, visually engaging. It seems like there was a while there where like this was happening really frequently and I was getting a lot of messages with emoji in them and then it kind of tapered off. So um, there was a big push there for a while where marketers were doing this to like and it became instantly fatiguing where you were like okay dude just delete 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 because my I know again my friends aren't sending me emoji in their messages and so usually it was kind of a quick visual cue yes that it wasn't someone I knew and so you know so just you know but keep I've seen mind, like it's worth trying i've seen the lightning bolt that says flash sale next yeah, to it and things true. like that and they're I, kind of interesting it's, it, it, if i it make, catches the eye yeah if i want if i still am interested in the brand if the brand hasn't ruined me yet yes. and i'm interested in what they have to say the emoji will still oh okay I see something this is it'll at least track my eye but if it's a brand i've never heard of before i didn't mean to engage with i accidentally got on their list somehow yeah that i'm just gonna be like oh this is this is lame it's and, not gonna help me 
the key here is to make sure that any emoji that you do use um, is relevant, relevant to your brand and relevant to your message. So just because it's a popular emoji does not belong. It doesn't mean it belongs in your subject I, line. I put uh, eggplant emojis on every email I send now yeah. because I think that that's just relevant yeah. all the time. Because you like purple so yeah, much. That's so it, it. just kind of speaks to those who purple. watch you on TV. So basically, you know, the benefits of emoji are they can be cute, they can be visually engaging, they can save you valuable real estate. We were talking about short subject lines. So if you've got something that conveys an instant, um, you know, like a some sort of money. Well, we give emoji, an example. example. In the show notes, we're going to give an example of uh, West Elm where they do, it says how we celebrate International Women's Day. And then they have uh, essentially five different faces of women mm -hmm. of varying nationalities. And yeah. so it kind of like, oh, it, it gives you a different sense of it just saying It causes you to pause and yeah. go, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it can help your subject line get noticed in a crowded inbox, but badly placed emoji can negatively impact open rates. Um, so this would be something like for, if it's an irrelevant emoji to your brand, for example, um, if it's something where like you're in a traditional industry, like say finance or construction, and you're using stuff that's kind of quirky and silly, then yeah. your audience isn't in that frame of mind. Especially if your brand expecting. isn't, if your brand is normally quite serious and you're like, mm -hmm. you're say, hey, I want to talk to you about investing in gold because that's what I'm talking about. And you put a little bag of gold next to your subject line. It's kind of like, oh, that's yeah. super cheese. Yeah. No thanks. Also keep in mind when it comes to emoji that not all of your recipients will be using the same email client. And if their email doesn't support emojis, it's going to convert it into that weird unrecognized grouping of symbols. Um, and there is no faster way to look like yep. spam than sending a subject line with like a bunch of weird symbols. But I, I, it sounds like we're really against it, but really emojis can be effective if you use them carefully. Just yes. like anything else, if you're if you're using their name and you're using emojis and you're using and you're like, "Oh, I'm just going to slam them with every one of these tips." You're you're not going to get great open rates. It's not like these are going to multiply. Oh, 30% open rates if I do these amount of characters. Oh, if I add emojis, I'll get another 20%. It's not you're not going to get 1050% open rates just because you're using all of these tips. Use them sparingly, consider it a, a conversation and over the long haul here's your name one and a couple email messages later here's an emoji a couple email messages later here's some urgency yes. yes yeah so that is a very important key here is that this is to give you because over the lifespan of this customer you're going to probably email them a multitude of times yeah. and if you do regular campaigns it's going to be something where they're periodically getting messages from you one to three i mean so i mean some people send pretty regular messages yeah. and you want to make sure that you have an arsenal of different tools at your disposal to be able to make your subject line engaging enough to cause that recipient to open your message. Yeah. Um, so tip number five, we're gonna talk about numbers and lists are your yeah, friends. They can be, yeah. I know. So yeah. So just like Buzzfeed, you know where they say, here's the top five mistakes that every uh, new wife makes. <laughs> I, I have a I'll, you email have me. A I'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But or it could be like you know the. Good the, thing I'm not a new wife. The, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty one years. <laughs> you tarnished a little. Anyway, if you say. <laughs> <laughs> but or if it's like you know the three ways you can kill your lawn this summer or yeah. seventeen ways to save money on water and and stuff like that. So, uh, Buzzfeed kind of create. It feels like Buzzfeed created it, but they probably didn't. But the mind is easier to see lists, and we see that oh these are, these are going to be short, quick, little, easy little tips, mm -hmm. and it makes us more inclined to check it out. And yeah, so this can counteract, uh, or this can be counterproductive if you make your number too big, just <laughs> FYI, at least for me, if I saw something that was like 59 ways you oh, can yeah. save money this summer, I'd well, be like, um, no. Actually, in some ways it can work if it's something that the target is totally interested in. Like, so Yeah, and you want to have a si show yeah. value. So yeah. like, like Digital Marketer does this one where they say, you know, our 101 best blog titles. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that's kind of, because probably 99% of those I'm not interested in. There'll probably be a couple of nice ones in there. And so you might download their little lead magnet to check that out. So All right, that's fair. It, 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 in some cases it can. But yeah, if, if you're just trying to get them to consume something quick and it's like 1,467 ways for you to <laughs> wear earrings, you're going to be like, okay, no, yeah, nope, no not interested. <laughs> the idea here is that the number and list makes the message seem more easily digestible. So um, five ways to help your kindergartner read proficiently. Top 10 French restaurants in Alberta. So you don't, uh, you know, want to go too crazy, but again, it's another good uh, 
tool for your arsenal. And the number should be numerical. It shouldn't yes. be uh, written out because if you write 15 out, people, oh, there's going to, of your 28, it's 39. It's going to seem weird. Yeah, it's just yeah. weird. The other thing is um, just from a flow perspective, you want to put the number in the start of your subject line instead of at the end. Take um, a look at our 15 best emojis for email open rates. Yeah, then yeah. the value of the number is lost. Yeah. So you kind of need to keep in mind that just from a standpoint of the way our brains work, that having the number at the beginning is what intrinsically gives it that digestible value. Yeah. And psychologically, this is kind of a weird one, but it's true, odd numbers like five or seven or three are easier to remember than even numbers, and they have a 20% higher click-through rate. Well, I'm not going to open up an email that says, get my two best tips for, you know, no, but when they say three best tips, I'm like, yeah, I'm You're down. In. Yeah. I'm totally down for that. Well, and even six, you know what I mean, versus five, it's weird. It's like, yeah. it's just the way your brain works. It's like five goes, yeah, that makes sense. And then six, you're like, mm. I don't know. When, when they say two, you're like, come on, just couldn't you just, just try a little bit more. harder? Yeah, I mean, come on. One more. <laughs> Tip number six focus on the benefits. What is that? Oh, benefits? Yeah, so you. E email, email with benefits. I like that, actually. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about it. In your subject line, you can cite common pain points to create an immediate interest in that recipient. So, done well, readers are going to want to learn more because you're referring to a common problem that they likely have and yeah. saying that you have some sort of solution. So, some examples of a universal pain point would be saving time or money or increasing profits. Um, and instead of listing a feature, just be specific and tell them something that they care about. Yeah. So if, if you're like, let's let's say you're you're selling squishy balls, because this seems to be really annoying to my wife this time. But if you're selling squishy balls and you just say, we have the best squishy balls because they're all white. That's a that's a feature. There's no real benefit to that. But if you say these squishy balls eliminate stress, you're like, uh -huh. oh yeah, that's that's something I can benefit from. Or yeah. our squishy balls stay white longer. You're like, oh, I don't really care about that. But if you say our squishy balls will make you nice and happy, <laughs> right? That might be okay. Well, hey, it makes me happy. Hey. Yeah. Something to fidget with while you're on a podcast. Yeah, right. Nice. So instead okay. of something like how to increase your conversion rate, you could be specific and say, increase your conversion rate by 50% in one week. Yeah. So um, it gives like a, a defined specific benefit. Specificity. Yes. I think that's important. right word. Yes. Tip number seven. Social, social proof. proof. Yeah. Social proof is cool because it's ultimately we are all lemmings. I'm sorry to tell you, but it's true. We want to like when my wife, when we first started dating, we, we were in France and we were looking in restaurants and, and I was like, Oh, let's go to this one. This one's got like pizza. I love pizza. Let's go there. And she's like, there's nobody in there. Yeah. I'm not going to go in there. And then we walked by this Chinese place and I don't really care about Chinese food. And it was crowded, a Chinese place in France. And she's yeah. like, let's go there. I'm like, oh, why? And she's like, because it's super crowded. It's got to be good. This is the Yelp mentality. Yeah. It's the reason that when you go to a new area and you pull out Yelp and you look for this restaurant had 7,000 people that said it was good. Yeah. This one only had three. So... Even if all three of them liked it, I still want to go with the 7,000. Yeah. So it's just part of our nature. We ultimately, people conform to the actions of others. Um, and so social proof creates an illusion that the behavior is correct if everyone else is doing it. If all 7,000 people like one Chinese restaurant in France, it's got to be good. Can't be that terrible, it, at least. It, well, unless they're giving away free food. Yeah, well. Or, or something. Yeah. Right? Then, okay. So in psychology, this is what's known as social proof. And most successful brands include reviews or as seen on social proof on their landing pages or their product pages. It drives a sense of product reliability, brand reliability. Yeah. Um, and so the question here would be, how do you include social proof in your subject line? Well, you can do something like uh, talk, call out specific influencers in the market you're going after. So you can say, why Kylie Jenner likes my tea, mm -hmm. right? And hopefully that's true, because if you <laughs> yeah. say that and she doesn't like it, you're going to get sued. Yeah. Uh, or you can say, uh, why more than X number of people like to use my product, like to use this product? Or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, five, five out of seven dentists say that, and, and why it would always be five out of seven, but five out of seven dentists say these will make your teeth whiter, right? Or why, you know, such and such anchor on this morning show, you know, if you're feeling like mm -hmm. you want to maybe promote a time when you've been featured, or why, you know, why Good Day Sacramento loves our... Ah, food? Let's go back to food. <laughs> 
So a, a, a site that does really well with this is is I get these emails constantly from uh, Vegas.com that has different like deals that are happening every month. And when you look at one of the deals, it'll say, you know, 10 people have taken this offer today or 60 people have claimed this offer. Uh, I also see that on Retail Me Not does that a lot if one of their coupon codes. And all of that tells you, oh, this is something that people are doing. This is normal behavior. I should also be part of this. Right. right? And you're like, oh, okay. It, plus it makes us feel safer, right? If we're sticking our neck out there to do something, we don't want to like get hurt by it, even if it's financially or, or, or psychologically or whatever, we want to be where it's safe and it's safe where there's lots of other people and where other people are being treated nicely. Right. We, we, we don't want to go someplace where people are treating us poorly. Right. Yeah. So a good subject. (laughs) Keep going. A good subject line has to grab a reader's attention and convince them that your email is important enough to warrant a click. So you need to stand out from the crowd of other messages in their inbox. For every email campaign, prepare at least five to seven subject lines and analyze each subject line to figure out which one has the best click through. This will cue you in on the most effective subject lines for your audience. Yes, that's true because your audience is going to be unique from a different audience that, you know, a certain set of subject lines that may work for one of our clients aren't necessarily the same as what will work most effectively for another. And again, as you always say, it's all about the data. Mm-hmm. You want to continue to do your A-B testing with your email subject openings, you know, keeping in mind that each offer is going to have a different rate of success and things like that. But you should be able to group your email subject lines in terms of style and yeah. what of these tips you may be implement in one subject line over another and if you find that urgency works well for your audience but emojis don't yeah. or personalization doesn't work for your audience but creating a social proof reference in your message does so you know just kind of keep an eye on it as you try different methods and again that main key is a number of different subject lines for each of your email campaigns so that for the same campaign, particularly if you come back to those campaigns over time, you can try different subject lines and test them against your champion and find your best your best pattern. And if you listen to our one of our previous episodes where we were talking about audience analysis, you can get to know that audience member a little bit better and so you can segment that list out and so you can send a different message to married females, a different message to the single men or a different message to, you know, the the so influencers. So this specific product line. Exactly. And that way you can test each different subject line for each different segment of your list. So that way you can say, well, this one didn't work for, you know, single females, but this one really worked for married men. So I'm going to make sure that I segment my list that way from now on. Okay, folks. Well, that is it for today. Make sure to check out the show notes at squirreldigitalmarketing.com slash podcast for links to the resources that we talked about today. And if you're finding our podcast to be helpful or cool. And who wouldn't? Be sure to rate it on whatever platform you're listening to it on or even better, leave us a review. Preferably a good one. Yeah. (laughs) And be sure to tune in next week when we reveal some insider secrets to faster keyword research. Doesn't sound all that scintillating to me, but uh, trust me, you don't want to miss it. That sounds like a curiosity loop you just opened there. Did you? Oh, yeah. Did you catch that? Well, I'm Ryan Eldridge. And I'm Andrea Eldridge. Thanks for tuning in to Growth Marketer Academy. This has been Growth Marketer Academy with Ryan and Andrea Eldridge. 